Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this informational forum being provided tonight, courtesy of the South Pasadena Preservation Foundation. My name is Mark Gallatin, and I'm the president of the foundation. The purpose of this forum is to be informational and educational. We believe that uh, the best end result in terms of policy will take place when everybody has full access to information and be able to discuss and debate the issues uh, intelligently with that information. So if you were expecting to see us come in and, and uh, bash another approach to the Caltrans issue, uh, it's not gonna happen here tonight. This is strictly about putting forth our proposal, our ideas for your consideration and let you make up your own mind. Um, we're fortunate tonight that we've got uh, a distinguished panel who I'll introduce here in a moment. But before I do that, let me just take a second to uh, give you some instructions on submitting questions tonight. Uh, questions will be taken in the chat room. Uh, so if you're not familiar with that, that's down at the bottom of your screen, uh, the chat uh, icon there. Just click on that and type in your question into the chat room. One other caveat, please make sure that you include your email address in the chat with your question. So uh, I'm sure we're likely to get a lot of questions. Uh, we're probably not gonna be able to answer every single one, but those that we don't answer, we wanna be able to at least respond back uh, via email. Also, uh, again, tonight, uh, we're not gonna be answering because we don't have the data to do so. Specific questions like, like, is my house on the Caltrans list or something like that? Um, you know, but these, this is intended more for uh, general questions and about uh, the, the Caltrans houses and specific questions about our proposed plan in particular. Uh, as I said, any questions not answered during the call will be answered via email. Now, what if you come up with a question after we're finished tonight and you say, darn, you know, I wish I would have asked that when uh, the call was still going on. Well, fortunately, we have an email address and I'll mention it several times tonight. Questions uh, after this event may also be emailed to caltranshomes at spreservation, all one word, dot org. That's Caltrans Homes, or one word, at sppreservation.org. Okay, well, I think that takes care of the housekeeping items. Um, so what I'd like to do now is provide an introduction to our panelists tonight, a little background biographical information about each of them. Uh, first up is Mr. Charles Loveman. Charles Loveman is the Executive Director of Heritage Housing Partners. He joined the organization in 2001. Prior to joining HHP, Charles was a principal and partner with Gilmore Associates, a real hey, estate Mark, development you firm. Mark, you don't need to read that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I appreciate it, but no one cares. Okay, very well. Uh, let's go on then to Christopher Sutton. Chris Sutton has been a passionate supporter of property rights in California for over 30 years. His work has concentrated in the area of civil litigation of property rights related lawsuits. Chris represents individuals, small businesses, and companies whose land is impeded upon by local government entities. He has also appeared on NPR's Which Way LA and been quoted in the Los Angeles Times, the Pasadena Star News, the San Jose Mercury, the Ventura County Star, the Riverside Press Enterprise, the Desert Sun, and the Contra Costa Times. Our third panelist is former mayor, Odom Stamps. Odom's ha Odom Stamps has a master's degree in architecture from Tulane University. He was born and raised in New Orleans and attended Isidore Newman School. Odom studied traditional architecture at Tulane and carries with him a great love for the richness of historic buildings. Odom serves on the South Pasadena Preservation Board currently as our treasurer. Since moving to uh, South Pass in 1993, Odom has tirelessly served the community as a member of the Cultural Heritage Commission and on the city council, including a term as mayor. 
And last but not least, another one of our former mayors, Dr. Richard Snyder. Dr. Schneider is an avid bicyclist, environmentalist, and lifelong social justice warrior. He served as a member of the city council from 2007 to 2020. Prior to that, he also served as a member and chair of the city's transportation commission and chair of the city's ad hoc bicycle committee. He's a member of numerous community groups, including South Pasadena Beautiful, Friends of the South Pasadena Public Library, South Pasadena Preservation Foundation, California Native Plant Society, Pasadena Audubon Society, LA County Bicycle okay, Coalition. Enough, enough. Okay. <laughs> and last but not least, he's a graduate of Yale University and Case Western University where he obtained his medical degree. So welcome to our panelists. Uh, and we will start off the program tonight then with our first presentation. Uh, Mr. Charles Loveman has a PowerPoint presentation and. I believe um, Mary has given him the ability to share his screen. So whenever you're ready, Charles. I am sharing the screen now. So I hope you all can see it. Does it look good? So yes. um, I, I thanks to the Preservation Foundation for uh, inviting me to speak. Um, I just wanted to talk about the Roberti Act and the Caltrans owned units, uh, the inventory of Caltrans properties in the South Pass. Uh, very quickly about Heritage Housing Partners. Um, we are a nonprofit affordable housing developer. We're based in Pasadena. We were founded 20 odd years ago. Our focus is on mixed income, meaning low, modern, and middle income home ownership. Uh, we've developed around 200 units uh, since our founding with another 103 units in our pipeline. And you can see the mix of units that we've developed. Uh, two of those units happen to be on property that we purchased from Caltrans uh, many years ago, almost 20 years ago, uh, in South Pasadena. So we do have experience uh, in South with, with in South Pass with Caltrans. Uh, these two units are we purchased the property at 1021 to 1023 Magnolia directly from Caltrans. I have no idea how we did it, and then we moved to uh, historic units that were on the site of the Mission Meridian project to the Magnolia site. Uh, many years later, we worked with the city to prepare a report that was issued in July of 2019 about the affordable housing opportunities within the Caltrans inventory. And then shortly after that, we partnered with the city of South Pasadena and the existing tenants at 626 Prospect um, to make a proposal to Caltrans in September of 2019 to purchase the, uh, that apartment building uh, and convert it to condos with uh, rights of ownership by the existing tenants. And unfortunately, um, Caltrans rejected that proposal uh, late last year. So I thought the first thing to do was just start by understanding what's the inventory of property, Caltrans owned properties in South Pass uh, this was the database that we put together in 2019. I know the city has a more recent database, uh, but for, for purposes of getting a big pick, order of magnitude picture, I think this is fine. So according to the database we got, uh, it was 98 properties total in South Pasadena, seven unimproved, me meaning vacant land, uh, 15 vacant properties, meaning vacant houses, and, and the vast majority, 76 properties of the 98, were are tenant occupied as of, of summer of 2019. Uh, as you probably all know, the Roberti bill was adopted in 1979. And as I read and reread and reread again, the Roberti bill, it seems there are sort of two large goals that that act is trying to accomplish. And the first one, first and foremost, is to minimize displacement of existing tenants. And then secondarily to me is to create affordable housing opportunities after the existing tenants have been uh, taken care of. When we speak about affordable housing, I think it's important to say that uh, Roberti defines affordability all the way up to 150% of median. I apologize if these numbers are small, hard to read, uh, but anyway, Roberti defines it all the way up to 150% of median, 
which compared to most other state housing programs is very generous. Median income statistics are for each county in, in California and then are uh, vary by household size. They're published annually, typically in April of each year. So this is the 2020 uh, income limits. So if we just sort of zoom in, the kind of baseline for uh, uh, household income is considered a four person household. So if you look at median income, LA County 2024, four person household, we're talking about a household that makes $112,000. Median income is the midpoint, right? Half of the incomes of the 10 million people who live in LA County are above that number and half are below that number. Now there, there's not all 10 million or four person households, but you can read across this line what the median is. Low income is defined as up to 80% of median. So again, looking at a four person household, we're talking about four person households, typically two, two, uh, you know, uh, two spouses and uh, uh, two wage earners and a couple of kids uh, earning 90 grand a year. Uh, and then you can see going across how it varies by household size. Moderate income is defined as from 80% to 120% of median. So you're talking about on a uh, four person household, uh, uh, households who make between 90 grand and 135,000 a year. And then middle income, again, that's unusual in most housing programs in the state, but Roberti goes all the way up to 150% of median. So you're talking about households that make between 135,000 to 167,000. And now when you take that information and you translate it into sales prices um, based on a formula in state law, uh, you get the following results. So I just wanted to do this so we sort of have a picture of when Roberti says a tenant can, a low income tenant can buy their unit, what we're talking about. So I picked two, three, and four bedroom units. The rule under state law is the number of bedrooms plus one equals household size. So a th three bedroom unit will be sold to a four person household or at least priced as if it's going to be sold to a four person household. And you can see in the low income category, the range is from 325,000 to 385,000, five bedrooms or higher, one bedrooms or less than this. Typical mortgage, typical down payment and most affordable housing programs down payment is 5%, not 20% as is typical in the market. And then these are typical mortgage payments. Moderate income, just to give you a, a sense, an order of magnitude is from about 550,000 to 650,000. And now we go to middle income, the, the, the bottom end of middle income in Roberti bill, 670,000 for a, four, a three bedroom unit, all the way up to 850,000. So when we talk about the range, the affordability range under Roberti, it's quite broad. And these price, these sales prices get up there. The thing I want to focus on is the, uh, the Roberti waterfall and the order of priority. So there's sort of three components to it. The, the, the existing tenant level of the Roberti waterfall, the housing related entity component of the waterfall, and then the market, the mar fair market value component. The, the, Existing tenant level is fairly straightforward and you can see the rules here. Um, tenants who are lower mod have rights, tenants who are up to 150% have, have rights. Um, former tenants who used to own this property in the 1950s have rights if they still exist. Um, there are a couple of exceptions for the existing tenants. If they own real property, owned real property within the last three years, uh, their rights uh, are nullified and uh, existing tenants who are earn more than 150% don't have rights under this part of the waterfall, but they do have rights under other parts of the waterfall. So that's the existing tenant level. We should really focus on the housing related entity level because that's where the city is. So it's this, this stuff in green. And at the housing related any level, the first sub level is for existing tenants in multifamily properties. Um, 
unfortunately is currently interpreted by Caltrans. These tenants only have rights if they intend to turn their apartment buildings, their multifamily buildings into something called a limited equity co-op. Um, my view of a limited equity co-op is kind of like the Wankel engine uh, without it getting too deep into the woods. Uh, the Wankel engine was, uh, limited equity co-ops are to affordable housing where the Wankel engine was in the 1970s to automobiles. Everyone thought this was the future of automobile engines. Everyone thought limited equity co-ops were the future of affordable housing and, and uh, um, common interest developments. Um, didn't work out quite that way. Unfortunately, we're still stuck with the limited equity co-op in the Roberti law and um, Caltrans takes a very narrow interpretation of it. The point of this being that for the few multifamily units in the inventory of units in properties in South Pass, uh, the way Caltrans interprets these rules, um, it pretty much nullifies these tenants' rights uh, to purchase their units in an apartment building. And now we get to the next level of the HREs, which is designated public housing related entities. There's only one in South Pasadena, only one entity that gets to play in this space. And that's the South Pasadena Housing Authority. Uh, they get to uh, uh, make offers on every property that Caltrans owns. Uh, the, they get to buy at a reasonable price, which is basically the economically feasible price in order to deliver affordable housing or whatever they're intending to deliver. As you can see, there's a first right of occupancy to current tenants, regardless of income. Uh, those tenants get to stay as renters and or, or as owners, depending upon what the public HRE is proposing to do, uh, regardless of income. Uh, and here, the tenants who are above 150% of median that were not allowed to play in the existing tenant space under the, that part of the waterfall, now uh, get uh, the, the public HREs have the obligation to offer to those tenants uh, at fair market value, the right to purchase their units. I wanna say when I go back here, when we did our report in 2019, we recommended that South Pasadena bid on everything that Caltrans was selling get the properties into escrow and then start to answer all the unanswered questions uh, related to each property, which would be what are the income of the existing tenants? Caltrans was not telling anybody what the incomes were, but obviously that was key because you have to figure out whether you're dealing with a low, moderate, middle or over income tenant. What's the condition of the property? Again, not a lot of information about property condition. How much money is it gonna cost to fix up these units? Where's the funding gonna come from and so on. So our advice to South Pass uh, is to, um, was to, to go after every property that in the Caltrans inventory. And I think that's part of the plan that you're gonna hear later. Um, and after the public HRE level, it goes to private HREs. Uh, you can see what the rules are here. Um, the only thing to note is at least as of 2019, there were only three private HREs that Caltrans had approved. So for this whole inventory, there are only three private HREs and one public HRE that get to play in the game of buying property from Caltrans. And then we go back to the order priority and look at the last level, which is the fair market value level. Um, and if the existing tenants don't purchase or HREs don't purchase, then these go down to a fair market value level uh, former tenants do have rights, but to pay at um, market, and then it goes to the highest bidder. So if, if properties get all the way to this level of the waterfall, there are some important questions. How are existing tenants protected? Are there any affordability requirements at this level? And what happens to the existing building stock? On all the other levels, if a tenant has a right to buy his or her unit, that implies that that unit is not going to get torn down. That unit is remaining. Uh, at this level, it's uh, anyone's guess. Um, when you put all of this together and try and uh, interpret what the Roberti Bill's vision of a neighborhood is, 
I, I would repeat first and foremost is to provide opportunities for existing tenants to remain in their units, regardless of their income at rents or sales prices that are appropriate to their income. Uh, and, and I say the same caveat, or the, I mentioned again the caveat, unless the waterfall goes to the fair market value level. I think that's something that we should all agree we want to prevent. Um, taking the translating the Roberti vision one more step, it seems to me that Roberti is envisioning mixed income neighborhoods. They're envisioning a mix of rental and home ownership units. And certainly the majority of the existing inventory uh, of, of properties will remain. Although it'd be nice if they would be all be brought up to code as part of this program. And as you probably know, under state law, ADUs can be added. And the same caveat about what happens if the waterfall gets to the fair market value level. Um, I do think there's some problems with the Roberti Act without getting too technical. Uh, I think multifamily properties are treated as an afterthought and Caltrans uses the limited equity co-op as kind of a got you to disqualify uh, tenants in, in the few multifamily buildings that exist. Um, I hope that that gets addressed. There are no minimum rehab standards for these units. There are minimum rehab standards when Caltrans sells direct to a tenant. Caltrans has an obligation to fix up the unit. But if a, a unit gets to the HRE level or the market level, there's no standards that I can see about what happens to the unit and does it get brought up to code or, or uh, whatever. There's clearly no clarity regarding the redevelopment of vacant or vac vacant land or vacant structures that I can tell in Roberti, although certainly there are uh, uh, zoning and general plan uh, uh, guide guidance from the city. And then the, lastly, the Roberti bill has this weird net equity rule, which I won't get into, except that it frustrates the ability to uh, do self-subsidizing, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Um, there's, I, it seem, seems to be open season on amending the Roberti bill. I, I would say that there's a couple of things to note. First of all, the physical condition of these properties varies from unit to unit, but generally speaking, these units need some work. Uh, in my view, policymakers consistently underestimate the cost to repair these units. And as I said before, and wouldn't it be great after waiting 41 years to see these units brought up to some higher level of, of condition? Uh, and as of two years ago, when we wrote our report for the city, there was no dedicated funding source to subsidize uh, the affordable units. Uh, one of the advantages of Roberti is because it goes up to 150%, you have the opportunity to self-subsidize by selling some units at higher price and then using the profits from that to subsidize lower income units. So uh, when folks are amending, proposing to amend the Roberti bill, I would ask three, I would ask one last question, which is what's the vision that that amendment is, is, is proposing. With respect to ownership versus rental, with respect to mixed income, with respect to the rights of existing tenants who have lived in these Caltrans houses for years and make over 150% of median, and with respect to maintaining, maintaining existing structures and the scale of the, the neighborhoods. And that's my presentation. And now I will and get back. Um, before you start, Mark, uh, uh -huh. may I make a request? Um, sure. That was just wonderful, Charles. We have a lot of people with many, many questions and we wanna make sure that they do get answered. So um, I, Steve, I'm gonna, Stephen Lawrence, who runs a South Pasadena, I'm going to put you on as a co-host so that you can post the email address and uh, make sure that everyone is confident that their questions may be answered. So uh, forgive me if I typed in the wrong response. Okay, and now I'm unmuting myself. And, and Mary, uh, Stephen has posted that in the chat room once, but it wouldn't hurt to post it again. And for those that maybe joined the meeting a little bit late, uh, let me just remind you that we are taking questions via the chat room. 
Um, so you can enter your questions there. We ask that you please include your email address with your question so that if we don't get to your question tonight, we can certainly get back to you uh, with an answer to it. Um, I wanna thank Charles Loveman for that very well done uh, overview of the Roberti Act. Um, just so you know the structure of tonight's meeting, um, in a moment here, I'm gonna be introducing uh, Chris Sutton, who will give us uh, a, a presentation on South Pass Preservation Foundation's proposal. Uh, and then we'll hear from our former mayors, Odom Stamps and Rick Schneider, uh, about maybe some of their experiences dealing with housing issues on the city council. And in Odom's case, uh, dealing with being a neighbor of a Caltrans property. So uh, at this point, before I introduce Chris Sutton, uh, I just wanna give a little bit of background also. You know, the South Pasadena Preserv Preservation Foundation, ever since it was founded in 1972, has been an integral part of the fight against the 710 freeway extension, a fight which we ultimately prevailed in. And now uh, the remaining legacy of that fight are these Caltrans properties. And when we formed a subcommittee on the uh, Preservation Foundation Board, which consists of myself, Odom Stamps, Mary Urquhart, and Joanne Knuckles, um, to look at ways to best address the question of the acquisition and disposition of the Caltrans properties, one of the things that we looked at were prior precedents where there was successful cooperation between the local community and Caltrans. And I'll just briefly mention those. Um, most recently, just in fact, she just told me before this call that the escrow has officially closed now, but we worked with uh, Lori and Grant Davis Denny, owners of the historic Garfield House, to help them acquire a parcel, a vacant parcel from Caltrans adjacent to their home that was originally part of the Garfield estate there. Uh, and that was done in conjunction with the Preservation Foundation and our role there was to uh, act as holders of a preservation covenant uh, to ensure that the historic character defining features on that site get preserved uh, in perpetuity. So a very recent success story of cooperation. Another example was back uh, in the year 2000 when the city and Caltrans uh, worked together to uh, effectuate the, the acquisition of a property at 2002 Berkshire using a process uh, called a side-by-side -side escrow. And I won't go into all the details of what that is, but um, it, it worked out quite well. Uh, the home was uh, bought by a family and rehabbed with a lot of sweat equity. And I understand they still own it today, 21 years later. Uh, the, the last example was back in the mid 1990s. Um, there was an expedited sales process which resulted in six historic homes being sold in South Pasadena to private buyers. And in each of those six cases, the Preservation Foundation again acted as a trustee uh, and held and still holds uh, preservation covenants to ensure that those historic homes are maintained with all their character defining features. But uh, enough about precedent, let's, let's get back to the present. And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce attorney Christopher Sutton to give us an overview of our proposal. Chris? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, in my opinion, I think, I think Charles did a very good job of, of setting forth the background. There's a few things I would disagree with, but in general, I think he did a great job. What we wanna do is we want to have people manage the, the, the properties and the sale of the properties who have an incentive to protect the tenants and the community. And Caltrans does not have that incentive. Caltrans has an internal uh, economic dysfunction where the tenants pay their rents to Sacramento and then Sacramento does not send the money back to Los Angeles to maintain the properties. That means that the properties that Caltrans in Los Angeles has an economic incentive to let the properties rot and become vacant. Because when the properties are vacant, it's not a drain on the Caltrans Los Angeles budget, even though Caltrans in Sacramento loses rent. And they've now increased 
uh, vacancies dramatically in the last 20 years, even though in 1999, they told Judge Pragerson that he should not include a required occupancy provision in his injunction that Judge Avery had included in the 1970s and had been in place until 1998, because he, he said, we have no incentive to vacate properties, which, well, might not have been a lie, it was a false statement. So what we wanna do is we wanna have a mechanism going forward that allows the cities to not only manage the properties as they now exist, keep the rents, manage the properties through the sales process, they could do the double escrow or whatever, and then the cities are providing a service to Caltrans who has created this mess over the last 60 years or, or 70 years almost, and that the cities should be compensated for that process, meaning that you would have a management and agency agreement entered into with each of the cities and Caltrans, and it would turn over 100% of management and control of the process, both the ongoing management of the process and the sale to the cities, and the cities would be allowed to keep, if not 100%, close to 100% of the rent and the sales proceeds for their valuable function to the state and the people of California in unscrambling this mess that Caltrans has created. Such a, a, a document would be a contract. It would require no new legislation. The, uh, it would be submitted. Each one would be submitted to the California Transportation Commission. In fact, there's a possibility the city could draft the contract unilaterally and submit it to the commission and see if the commissioner will approve it even if Caltrans objects. But the idea is the cities have direct accountability to the people who are gonna be most affected. The tenants, the adjoining neighbors, and, and the local community, which has to bear the cost of fire protection, police protection, and, 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 uh, you know, and code enforcement. So that by unifying the management and sale in the control of the cities, we ha will have an accountable process, we'll have a more rapid process, and the cities could be uh, substantially compensated by, for that by receiving most of the rents or all the rents and most or all of the sales proceeds ultimately. The, the bill that Senator Portentino ha has amended and introduced a week or so ago takes a good step in that direction, but it doesn't go far enough because it would require in this instance, the city of South Pasadena to come up with an upfront cost of all the properties. And, and that would be a huge burden at minimum the, the, the bill should be changed or the agreement could be written that the city should not have to pay back Caltrans until all the properties are sold at the tail end. Otherwise, the, the upfront burden on the cities is huge. I think that's why the city of Pasadena has chosen not to participate in SB 381. And what's, what's really important about SB 381, the Senator has said he will amend the bill however the city of South Pasadena requests. However, and what's, what we've seen with the other bill, the bill involving El Sereno, SB 51, 100% of the legislators treat that bill as a constituency or district bill by Senator DeRazo, and they don't really care what's in the bill because it's her district. And, and so that the insight we have from SB 51 is that SB 381, could include anything that Portentino wants in it and anything that the city wants in it. And so the bill needs to be amended if it's gonna go forward to say that the cities don't have to pay this upfront cost. Now, apparently there's been some communication between Caltrans and the city of South Pasadena and, so, and Caltrans has said that the upfront cost, even at what they call the original purchase price, which I dispute, is $6 million. That's, I think that's impossible. And I think they're imposing the inflation adjustment, which is soon to become illegal if we, and our lawsuit is trying to make it illegal through the courts. But I believe that the, the city of South Pasadena needs to step up and exercise much more aggression 
in terms of getting what they want out of this. And I think they can do it. When the senator appeared at the council meeting two weeks ago, he told them, I didn't write this bill, you wrote it, whatever you want in this bill, I'll put in. And what the legislature has done on Senator DeRazzo's bill is because it's his district, and in addition, Senator Portentino is the chairman of appropriations. I believe he can get anything he wants through the legislature. The, the, the DeRazzo bill, which the tenants had objected to for a lot of reasons, but it has, re, it has been voted on unanimously in all, all the committees in the Senate, and so far all the committees in the, the Assembly, it's, it's gonna go back to the Senate. And so, so far, all the objections to the DeRazzo bill have fallen on deaf ears because both the Democrats and Republicans believe this is her district. She gets to do what she wants. And I think that aspect of, of the Portentino bill, I think is important. Overall, and again, one of the things that, that Mark for, forgot to say is I've been representing tenants in these houses since the early 1980s, since before I became a lawyer. And uh, so I've been representing people up almost 40 years, tenant individually, tenant organizations, and we filed lawsuits for the tenants. And, and it's my goal is to keep everybody in their home, have the homes be affordable, preserve the neighborhoods, stop this process of vacating properties and endangering not just the tenants, but all the adjoining property owners. I own a house. My house is three blocks from the Caltrans corridor in Pasadena. You know, and if you've seen what uh, terrible shape some of these houses are in, it's a very dangerous situation. And, and you know, it, and, and we need to get the cities directly in charge of preserving the safety of these houses so that I believe that there's no, no real need for legislation if the, 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 legis the legislators from these cities get behind it, this management and agency agreement could be uh, essentially imposed on Caltrans, that when the, when the CTC held a hearing on these houses in mid-January, two of the CTC members said to the Caltrans staff, why don't you just give these to the city? And Caltrans had, not, had no response. When former District 7 Director Belinsky spoke at a forum in Pasadena in November of 2019, it was about you know, 200 people in the room, he said, I think the headache that we're, we're, we're seeing here, we just as soon give the cities these houses so that there's the, 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 the Caltrans doesn't even want to do the job that the Roberti bill tells them to do. And that's why I think that we have a unique opportunity here uh, with, with, the, with the willingness of Senator Portentino to take this on with his position in the leadership of the legislature as the chairman of appropriations. Oh, and there's, and I think we can, if we can convince the majority of the city council of South Pasadena to demand 100% of what they want, control and 100% of the money, I think they will get it. Now, something happened last week which has not been revealed. So Senator Portentino amended his bill two weeks ago. On Friday of last week, six days ago, Caltrans sent a large number of letters to existing tenants who said, you, if you wanna buy the property at fair market value, you have to come up with the financing in 30 days. Your deadline is April 19th, 2021, or you waive your rights. And I've gotten a lot of calls from people. I don't know whether it's just the 29 properties that were not found to be affordable in, in the round they started in 2018, but it may be more than the 29 properties, but I believe they've sent it to the entire list of 29 properties. I've told people to call the Senator's office, get the deadline extended. If you're, if you're having to come up with a million dollars of financing or a letter of credit in 30 days, it's not gonna be possible. The, the letter was unclear on whether the repairs are gonna be deducted from the price, That's the, which is required by the Roberti law, that they get to buy the property at market minus the cost of repairs. Now, I have one client who was told during the appraiser's walkthrough that the cost of repairs exceed the cost of the property, yet they've been told that they're going to have to pay $750,000 to buy their house, and, and the, the husband is in a wheelchair, and Caltrans has, all, has for decades refused to make handicap improvements to the properties, 
So this letter that Caltrans has set out, I believe is an attempt to sabotage the, the, the Portantino bill by saying, oh, we're gonna get all these things wrapped up in sales quickly before the Portantino bill forces us to sell the properties at the original price to the city. So the Caltrans staff has been undermining the goals of the Roberti bill for decades because they don't even believe, even though they have no right to question it, they don't believe that the law is proper. In 2009, when, when Senator Portantino was in the assembly, he obtained for the tenants an attorney general's opinion written by then Attorney General Jerry Brown that said the Roberti bill is constitutional. It's not a gift of public funds. It's not a violation of the gas tax provisions of the state constitution. The gas tax provisions say proceeds from gas tax, which also means property acquired by gas tax, can be used for transit, highways, or the mitigation of the adverse effects caused by highway projects. That's what this is. The entire Roberti bill is mitigation of the adverse effects. Caltrans has injured these communities, has done terrible, dishonest things for going on 60 or 70 years. There needs to be a way to get them out of the process. And the, 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 the management agreement we've proposed is a form of mitigation. SB 381 with some changes is a form of mitigation. No one has said that the Durazo bill is unconstitutional. We, we've claimed that it's too local and it should be, uh, the, the, any bill should be corridor wide, but we believe that anything done to preserve these houses, to preserve the housing, to create more housing is a form of mitigation and Caltrans is resisting, the Roberti bill is resisting everything. And these letters they sent out last Friday are the latest indication that they do not intend to let the legislature tell them what to do. So that's kind of the end of my presentation and outline, but uh, I, I think we're at a, at a critical political moment. And if a majority of the South Pasadena City Council asks for this, the Senator will give it to them. And by changing the bill to that, I believe Pasadena will want to join in the bill. I believe that the bill will show that the Durazo bill is in fact misguided. And I'll believe that she'll fold her bill into the Portantino bill. So we'll have a standard bill for the whole corridor. But the leverage guess, we um, need to get is, is get the council moving and then get Portantino moving and then take it to the next step. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate you staying within the allotted time. Um, I want to make sure that we hear from our other uh, panel members. And then after that, we're going to uh, go into the last part of the program, the Q&A. Uh, and again, I'll encourage anybody who has questions, please enter them into the chat room along with your email address. And if you have questions after this forum concludes tonight, uh, you can go to caltranshomes at spreservation.org. That's Caltrans Homes at spreservation.org to submit questions after the forum. Um, I, I again appreciate and thank Chris Sutton for his uh, very well uh, worded overview of the proposal that we've come up with. Uh, just wanted to add that uh, we at the Preservation Foundation uh, believe that this proposal has three key features that merits its consideration. Number one, it preserves the rights of existing Caltrans tenants who are first in line to purchase the homes in which they live. Number two, it provides a mechanism for by which vacant houses can be sold expeditiously and rehab can begin to facilitate the restoration of neighborhood fabric and the elimination of blighted unsafe conditions. And third, it promotes local control and flexibility. Although our plan was generated right here in South Pasadena, it has the advantage of being applicable to our neighboring corridor cities of Pasadena and the El Sereno neighborhood in Los Angeles, if they so desire, uh, which is consistent with what Governor Newsom called for last year for a corridor-wide solution. So uh, again, thank you, Chris. And now uh, I will open it up to our former mayors, Odom Stamps and Rick Snyder, whoever would like to go first and talk about your uh, experiences dealing with housing issues, uh, specifically 
regarding the Caltrans properties or uh, personal experiences of living on a street with Caltrans properties? Go ahead. Odin. Thank you, Mark. Okay, Rick, if I go first. Sure, please, please do. Thank you. So um, I've lived here in South Pasadena on Fairview Avenue, uh, just off of Columbia at the North End since 1994. When I moved to the neighborhood, there were three houses um, that were, well, two houses and an, and an empty lot that no one was living in. Uh, one of them uh, was finally rented, but um, 10 years ago, it went empty again. So there are currently two houses, both of them um, uh, over 100 years old. Actually, one of them is probably closer to 120, and yet it's not listed on an inventory from Caltrans as a historically eligible protected property. Um, being empty, uh, really, it is a opportunity for Caltrans, as Chris was saying, to uh, practice demolition by neglect. Uh, if you were to look at the outside, it looks relatively presentable, although the front porch details have long ago rotted and, and been hauled away. But it's painted periodically because we get a lot of film crews in our community that uh, see it as an eyesore and put a minimum of uh, paint effort to make it look passable in the neighborhood as they're filming. So that's the only way that this property gets anything in the way of upkeep. Uh, it's my neighbor, we share a, uh, a side yard and uh, it's really too bad. In 2010, uh, I needed to acquire some storage space. And I looked at that empty building and I got in touch with the right-of-way manager, Linda Wilford. And she agreed to show it to me, understanding that it couldn't be inhabited because there's no um, power or uh, uh, electrical or, or water hookup. Uh, but we did walk inside the front door and probably made it three steps and then looked at each other and got out. The floor was sagging, and we're talking about 2010, so 11 years ago, uh, to the point where it, we worried that it would fall through. And I was aware that there was a full basement under this house, so it would have been quite a drop if it had uh, fallen through. And that was the end of Linda Wilford being interested in renting it, even uh, uh, for me to store some, uh, uh, some records and boxes. Uh, there is really not much of an effort that Caltrans puts in to uh, rent these houses when they go vacant. We've had to take them to court uh, several times in order to keep them uh, at uh, the, the uh, uh, requirements of renting them before Judge Pragerson um, uh, <laughs> didn't impose that term further. Also to keep them main, maintaining their property at least at a basic level. They're just terrible as landlords. Um, I would also point out that uh, we have, as a both a community and then later as a city, sued Caltrans to get them not to sell them in batches, which at that time, uh, Chris represented uh, one of the uh, neighborhood interests. And also we had the uh, uh, corridor renters uh, represented in court. And though we didn't win the first round, we got a, uh, a settlement agreement so that they wouldn't do this. Naturally, 10 years later comes by and they tried it again. And at that point, I was on the city council and we did in fact uh, file suit and our then city attorney, Dick Terzian, uh, won that round and shut them down from selling them in large groups to uh, uh, their favorite pet HREs. Uh, looks like uh, we're back up again 10 years later for an another uh, try by Caltrans. So I just want to point out to you that um, Caltrans does not seem to uh, work and follow the law. And it's quite often that groups like our city, the Sierra Club and the South Pasadena uh, Preservation Foundation step in to get them to comply with uh, the laws like the Roberti Act. Um, it's discouraging and it looks like we might have to do it again if they don't get this, uh, this uh, agreement to uh, put the houses back into the community. Uh, the worst thing I think that can be done is to turn it over to uh, a nonprofit HRE that has no incentive to bring it up to 
uh, restored historic standard, much less bring it up to code, and would rent them out at, at, at a um, low income rental where the, the tenants can't afford uh, or not incentivized to keep up the property. So that would be sort of the worst of all worlds, whether it's our city or whether it's a um, private HRE. They, they, there needs to be an incentive to fix these properties up and return them to our tax roll because this, the other thing that Caltrans has gotten away with for decades is paying a pittance uh, of money in return to South Pasadena for removing all of these houses and properties away from our tax base, which has cost us, uh, you know, having a much uh, um, underserved um, level of revenue and, and causes us to uh, pay more for our uh, needs in government. All right, thank you, Odom. Dr. Snyder, we'd like to hear from you. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to say, uh, as a first principle, I think the city needs to get control of the houses, either by having the Caltrans given to us, or we get an executive management agreement, as uh, Chris Sutton was describing. In any case, we have to get them out of the leadership role. They, they have been in incapable and unwilling to actually work with the community about getting these houses back into the community. Second thing is, I, I'm glad Odom brought up that, uh, that point about the tax revenue. Uh, we've been getting about $100,000 in tax revenue for a number of years, which is way below what those properties would have brought in if they had never been purchased, if they'd still been in private ownership. We're talking about several million dollars of property taxes that are owed to the city by Caltrans. And I think the city council ought to make an effort to recoup at least some of that money. Now, I would like to talk a little bit about the 626 Prospect uh, apartment building. Uh, I was working with Charles Loveman a couple of years ago on getting that to be sold uh, as, as, as several units. At that time, there were 12 units in the building and seven of them were unoccupied. And the other five, the owners and the, uh, the renters there wanted to purchase their particular units. And our plan very simply was to sell, was to fix up the units and sell the unoccupied units in market value and using that uh, excess income to uh, support the lower income units that are in the remaining part of the apartment building. Now I'm told that they rejected our proposal because they said it was illegal. And I would like to find out either from Chris Sutton or from the city council to find out whether in fact that is illegal under state law. Now, if it is illegal, I think that's one of the things that we could ask for the Portantino bill to do is to make it possible for us to sell units at market value and use the proceeds to, uh, to subsidize low income uh, units. You know, the city is under tremendous pressure to provide more affordable housing in the city. And that's one of the ways we could do it. And a number of the units uh, that the city, that, that are owned by Caltrans are, are, are much too high in, uh, in value to be given to low income because they can't afford the, the maintenance on them. So it'd be better to sell those at market value and use the excess profits to, to provide other affordable units within the city. So those are the main points I wanted to bring out is that we offered uh, Caltrans a very reasonable proposal and they delayed and delayed and delayed on it. And finally they rejected it saying it was illegal. And I would I'd like to find out if that's the case. Thank you, Dr. Schneider. Um, we have uh, plenty of time here for questions and answers. Um, uh, I pledge to everybody that uh, this forum would not go past 8.30. So uh, we do have time for questions and answers. And we've got a lot of questions in the chat room. So I'm going to uh, select a few here to start off. And the first one is, is Heritage Housing Partners a different group than the city is proposing to use? I think uh, I can answer that. Uh, uh, the, the current proposal that was presented last week at the city council meeting um, envisioned using a firm called Civic Stone uh, in the role of advisor uh, and consultant to the city. Uh, and Mark, if I can say, um, my interest, Heritage Housing Partners' interest is still trying to uh, resurrect the 626 proposal 
uh -huh. uh, and, and reverse the decisions which Caltrans made to reject that proposal. All right. Well, did, do you believe that, they, that it was illegal, what we had proposed? We were, so there was one of the five tenants who was over income. So that was the only unit that we were proposing to sell at market because they, that, that particular tenant's income was above 150% of median. Uh, we were selling some units at the higher end, at the, at the at middle income, and some units at low income, some of the vacant units at high at middle income and some at low income in order to self-subsidize the two. But the only unit that was being sold at market was to an existing tenant who, based on my reading of the law, they had rights to buy at whatever their income, uh, whatever price their income supported. And I think uh, they, they rejected us because of the limited equity co-op BS. They said, since we didn't say we were going to be a limited equity co-op, that we must have intended not to be a little limited equity co-op. And therefore, we got you and you're out. Well, nice work, Charles, because you just answered the next question, which was, <laughs> what was the reason Caltrans rejected the 626 prospect proposal? So the interesting thing about the 626 proposal was it we partnered with the existing tenants. So we thought that we were at that sort of first sub-level of the HRE waterfall where the, the tenants of the multifamily properties have rights. And then just in case we partnered with the city of South Pasadena so that we could drop to the public HRE. Um, the, the limited equity co-op is a, is, is a landmine. Uh, like I said, it's the Wankel engine of housing, in my opinion. Uh, you know, I put on the slide that, that you can judge the impracticality of it by how many lenders don't lend to co-ops. But I think the more troubling thing was that Caltrans rejected the city as a public HRE because the city was intending to transfer title to us uh, and, and have uh, you know, us, the tenants and, and heritage housing partner who had formed a 50-50 partnership do the rehab work, do the condo map, and, and sell the units. And this Caltrans said the city didn't, ha didn't have a role or responsibility in the deal because they were transferring title to us, and therefore they nullified the city's public HRE rights. Okay, our next question is actually in the form of a statement, and uh, this goes back to one of the slides in Charles' PowerPoint presentation on the income levels uh, this person says these numbers are higher than those on the California state site for 2020. And just to clarify, I believe your slide was just for LA County. Is that correct, Charles? Yeah, my slide was for LA County. Um, the state publishes probably a dozen different income schedules and they gave specific guidance uh, when we were submitting our proposal of which income schedule to use. Mm -hmm. So that's the one that I used. All right. Okay, our next uh, questioner asks, will this presentation be recorded and posted? Uh, yes, and yes. Uh, I mentioned at the outset, and maybe once or twice, recording tonight's forum, and I'll uh, rely on our technical guru on our board of directors, Stephen Lawrence, uh, to help us get it posted on the South Pasadena Preservation website, which is SPPreservation.com. Org. Okay, let's see what our next question is. Will a copy of the slides be available for download? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to share my slides. And would, would people go to um, HHP's website for that, Charles, or how can they? I'll, I'll send them to the Preservation Foundation and then you can uh, do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay, someone asked where uh, such as on a directory, website, et cetera, will these available Caltrans homes be listed for sale? When a home is listed, where are they listed? How do you submit an offer? And Chris wants to answer that one. 
Chris, you're muted. Chris, okay. you're muted. Okay. Yeah, in, in the Caltrans, Caltrans posted a list of 42 properties at their website in July of 2014. Now, that was the most current list of what they've determined to be surplus and sellable. They also posted a list of 11 vacant lots to sell. Of those uh, properties with housing, 10 or 11 have sold uh, starting in 2018, and about five or six of the vacant lots have sold. There is Caltrans um, engages in an artificial practice of pretending that the properties are not surplus to avoid having to sell them. So, in, and, and until Caltrans officially declares them surplus, they're not officially available even to the tenants. So right now, the only properties that in theory are available are that list of 42 and another list of 11 minus the ones that have already sold. And, and the other ones, whether they're occupied or, or not, those people have just received these letters saying they have to buy at affordable, I mean, at market value within the next 30 days. So Caltrans does not engage in a general uh, transparency about what's being sold or not, because they believe, I think, that they are unable to sell all 460 properties in the corridor at once, or the 100 or so that are in South Pastina and the other 100 in Pastina and the other 200 and something that are in El Sereno. So that Caltrans is putting a, a, a clamp on the sale process and preventing them from really going through. So that they've sold approximately 15 properties in the last two years. And if they follow that pattern, it's gonna take them 90 years to sell all the properties, right? So they just, and so that there's not really a good source of information. I have a list that my office prepared based upon the assessor maps and the Caltrans maps three years ago, and I'll send that list to whoever wants it. But that's, that's the list of all the properties. It's not a list of what they're selling, but that's the first step to understand what the universe is. So it's a long answer, but that's, I think, the best I can say. All right, thank you, Chris. Our next question. May I? Um, uh, oh, yes. Our city manager, Sean Joyce, has uh, answered a question and he said that Civic Stone is not being considered for proposing to act as an HRE. Just wanted to. Very point. good, and I appreciate that, Mr. Joyce. I stand corrected. Thank you very much. Um, our next question is, can someone buy the home they grew up in if they no longer live in the area? Uh, Chris, you need to unmute yourself, please. Okay. The problem is that the waterfall, the list of priorities are such that if you're not a, a, a current tenant who was a former owner or a current tenant or, or on the list that's going down, people coming in from the outside who have no current connection to the property probably don't have a leg up. Though if we do our bill, I mean, do our agreement, the cities may be able to open that up somewhat. Uh, you know, one of the great vacant houses is the house that Julia Child grew up in in Pasadena. And it's been vacant for over 20 years. Uh, uh, Senator Portillo and I walked, happened to be able to walk through it with Caltrans back in 2013. But it's not in terrible shape. It needs a lot of work. But I'm sure, you know, there are, it's, it's a property where a historic person grew up. I don't know if there's any way to get outside the waterfall to bring in outsiders, but the empty properties and the vacant lots, particularly the vacant lots, are, are gonna have to be sold in a way that may not comply with Roberti because there's nobody in theory who can you know, do the work that's necessary. The vacant lots that Caltrans has sold thus far, they've sold two to the city of South Pasadena for, for pocket parks, and they sold three to real estate developers in Pasadena who've now built very expensive houses on them uh, uh, next to the off-ramp north of California. So I don't think that a former owner is gonna have any ability to
to get in line. I'm sorry. All right, thanks, Chris. Let's go to our next question. What help or advocacy can South Pasadena provide to former tenants who had to fold and move because of unfair rental hike practices by Caltrans? And uh, Odom, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I'm not going to answer the question directly, but I want to let you know that we actually have been advocating for the tenants and the tenants that were evicted by Caltrans uh, during the time of Assemblyman Lou transitioning into uh, Senator Lou and now uh, uh, Anthony Portentino, Senator Portentino. Uh, we could not get Caltrans to move on, the, on, on these uh, issues. And there was a time 15 years ago when they received about $35 million to supposedly uh, do code upgrades. They spent all of the money in Pasadena and it didn't even make it to South Pass or to El Sereno. And uh, in doing it, they evicted tenants to supposedly address uh, problematic code issues. They spent, spent it on the exterior, never got to the interior, and those people have never been allowed to return to their houses. And it isn't fair and it isn't right and i'm not sure what can be done about it because we've had two state senators focused on this chris would you concur chris you're muted sorry you're still muted yeah well i have to get permission to get on you so the answer is there is in theory at the bottom of the waterfall a a category for the former tenants, uh, Caltrans does not maintain a list of them as far as I know. Mm. A lot of people who were wrongfully evicted based upon either their complaints about the condition of the property or other technical violations. A number of people were evicted because they repaired the property themselves to keep it safe and they were forced to leave. So I, I, I think that there should be a process to try to figure out who the former tenants were and who were wrongfully evicted but it's, they're at the very bottom of the waterfall um, and it's gonna require some uh, communication with those people. I'm in contact with some of them. Some of them are, are still members of the tenant organization. They've moved elsewhere, but it's a, it's a, it's a, hard, uh, it's a hard job to, to, to handle. However, if the cities get the management, right? Which means the Caltrans will have to turn over all the records. The cities may be able to do some of that, you know, um, uh, of uh, recompense to bring justice to the dozens of tenants who were thrown out for specious reasons, you know. Um, so I agree with Odom. If we could do it, it would be a good thing. But Caltrans is not going to do it. All right. Our next I'm question. Sorry, Mark, to interject again. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. I'm, it, there are so many texts and thank you all for coming and my goodness, the panelists are wonderful. But the, the city is continuing to challenge Caltrans decision on the 626 project. Mm -hmm. So we need to be aware that the city is trying to fight this. Thank you, Mary. Very important, thank you. All right, our next question, uh, bear with me because it's a long question and it's specifically for Chris Sutton. Uh, it says, political question for Chris Sutton regarding moral hazard. Caltrans has completely failed to meet its responsibilities for the management of these properties and the consequence of their failure under the present proposal is to release them from their responsibility and let them walk away from their mess, their incompetence made. Is there any argument for working through the courts and the political system to just make Caltrans do its job? It seems to me that there's a danger in rewarding failure by letting a government agency just quit. We're letting Caltrans fail without consequence, and it seems like there would be long-term value in beating them into complying with the law. Well, again, there were there were three federal court injunctions over the last uh, 50 years: 1973 by Judge Avery, 1979 by Judge Avery, and 1998 by Judge Pregerson. 
And uh, uh, up until 1998, 99, the properties were all occupied and the, 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 the gentleman's agreement that the tenants and Caltrans reached, which operated effectively up through 2002, was that Caltrans would do no repairs. The tenants would do the repairs themselves. They would submit the receipts to Caltrans and Caltrans would take that cost off their rent. And so the properties were allowed to get be maintained somewhat by the tenants going into their own pockets. 2002, the district director and the property manager at Caltrans stopped doing that. So the tenants had no ability to do the repairs themselves and they refused to give credits to rent to anybody uh, for anything. And because their plan starting in 2002 was to accelerate vacating the properties. So I don't know what to say. I think if we were to go into court and sue them, and even if we were to win, the, the ability of a judge to hold their feet to the fire, because I, I just don't think the worst situation, I think, is to let them continue. And I agree. They are wrongdoers. They are, they are grotesquely wrongdoers. And they've been doing wrong for half a century. And so is there a way we can look back and somehow say someone's got to pay damages? I'm not sure that's the best approach. The best approach is to get them out of these properties and let someone who can do the job do it and let them have the money from the sales and from the rent. So I don't I think you go back and try to punish Caltrans for their past misbehavior, it's gonna take a lot of resources and time and the houses will continue to be uh, in their control. We just, getting them out of Caltrans control I think is paramount. That's, that's why I think I agree with the sentiment that you have these, these wrongdoers who are getting away with what they've done wrong for so long. But we can't solve every problem and we have to stop it someplace and move in a new direction. That, so I, I, I'm sympathetic, but I don't think it's practical. All right, uh, we have time for a few more questions. Um, our next questioner uh, says, the 626 Prospect property is a multifamily issue. It does not bear any significance over single family or vacant properties or vacant lots in South Pasadena, is that right? I believe that's right. Okay. Thank you. Next question, can the uh, Portentino bill or does the, Port the Portentino bill seems to expand the type of co-ops, is this correct? Again, I'd be speculating. It'd be better for Chris. Right. Chris, you're still muted. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think Senator Portentino is responding to the criticism that the tenants groups had on the Durazo bill, that the Durazo bill eliminated the co-op rights in El Sereno, and it simply preserves whatever rights exist. And, I, and, Char and Charles you know, should have gone a little farther because the co-op entitlement is based upon a feasibility limitation. And part of the reason why the decision that Caltrans made on 626 was fundamentally wrong is because the time period to judge the feasibility of the co-op had not yet arisen. And so that the decision to use the co-op or not use the co-op should have occurred later you know, after the sales process went through and whether it was just going to be a regular HRE with tenant participation or a co-op. So Caltrans, you know, basically jumped over the process and denied rights to the tenants and to uh, Charles's group at a time when it wasn't appropriate. So the, the, the Portentino bill doesn't really expand the tenant co-op rights. It keeps the POA on rights in place as they now exist, which are limited to this feasibility requirement. And, and, and it, so you have to have a lender, you have to have the tenant's participation, and you have to have an honest estimate of the cost of repairs. The, the, the competitive HRE that Caltrans chose grossly underestimated the cost of repairs by at least a million dollars to, to take an advantage that where, where Charles's group honestly represented what was going to be the repairs 
by grossly underestimating the repairs, the competitor says, oh, we can do it for less, but you can't. It's a physical impossibility. And so Caltrain's awarded this in an unfair way. So I don't think the, the Martin Penal Bill expands those rights, but it preserves them subject to the feasibility requirement that's now in the law. All right. Uh, one person wanted to know, is uh, the Caltrans rejection of the city's proposal to purchase 626 Prospect available uh, to the public? And I want to, again, thank our city manager, Sean Joyce, who responded to that in the chat room. But I wanted to uh, let everybody know that uh, the proposal, uh, or I should say Caltrans rejection of the city's proposal, is available by contacting the city manager's office at City Hall. I believe that rejection was just the form of a letter saying we didn't get it. Uh -huh. they, they actually issued a, at the request of the city, they did a detailed uh, explanation of why they rejected the city. So there was a rejection in November and then a follow-up letter in December of 2020. Okay, uh, we've almost gotten through all the questions here so far. <laughs> One more just came in. How many apartments does Caltrans have in the city? I think there are, Chris may know better than me, I don't think there are more than five or six multifamily properties. It's, it's a small universe. Can you unmute Chris again? Chris is still muted. Yeah, right, okay, I'm okay now. So there's a large number of duplexes and triplexes that in, in the, when, when the Roberti Bill was applied in, in Echo Park and Silver Lake in the 1980s, those got roped into the, uh, the uh, housing co-ops as multiple. Uh, Caltrans is telling tenants who live either in one unit or, or both units of duplexes that they can't buy because it's a multi-unit property and therefore they're, they're, they're categorically ineligible. So I do think there's only a, a very few apartment buildings. I think there's a larger number of duplexes and triplexes within the city. Uh, and Caltrans is using the multiple family designation to deny the residents of those properties the ability to buy under any circumstances. So that's, they're, they're turning it back on itself in some ways. Chris, if I can ask a follow-up to that, uh, then what about the state law that allows ADUs in any garage on a single family, otherwise single family um, property? Doesn't that turn them all into duplexes? Potentially, if you could unmute Chris. Uh, Mary, can you unmute? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, the, the, those ADUs are something that would occur in the future. And the way in which the Roberti Bill operates is it defines the properties as they currently exist. So if you, and several weeks ago, I attended the uh, Councilman Kevin DeLeon's presentation on his plans for the corridor in El Sereno. And they're talking about ultimately putting ADUs on most of the properties if they, if they can fit. Uh, but at the moment, the Roberti Bill does not anticipate what will happen in the future in terms of the construction of an accessory dwelling unit so that you can't define a property today based upon what it could be in the future. I, I think that's gonna be a, a, a real stretch to go down that road. Okay. Next question, can someone tell us more about the historical significance of some of the Caltrans homes? For example, the home next to us is the oldest standing green and green. How can we preserve these important houses and guarantee that the restoration is done appropriately? Well, I'll take a stab at the first part of that question. Uh, I know that in the staff report that was provided to the city council last week, there was a list of 68 Caltrans properties. And um, I did my own research on it and found that 25 of the 68 are listed on our local inventory of cultural resources. And uh, I think for the second part of the question of how we preserve these important houses and guarantee that the restoration is done appropriately. I talked uh, earlier about uh, past experiences where our Preservation Foundation has been a trustee to uh, hold and administer preservation covenants. Um, 
And Chris, do you have anything to add as far as how our proposal would um, expand coverage to, yes, get him unmuted again, uh, expand coverage to uh, a, a larger number of historic homes than maybe is allowed under current state law? Well, because Caltrans receives federal money, the, the National Preservation, the Historic Preservation Act applies to Caltrans. So Caltrans has a duty to ensure that properties that are eligible to list on the National Register are adequately prepared and preserved under the Department of Interior standards. But in terms of the state and local listings, uh, I don't think Caltrans is gonna respect any of those listings because they don't have to. But, and I believe if we do the management agreement and control the properties, the city can impose their own standards regarding historic preservation, recognize the city's uh, designation, recognize the state designation. You know, uh, I think it, it, it would clearly move in that direction. In addition, I think it's important for the covenants to be held and enforced by a private preservation organization and not be held by Caltrans who cannot be relied upon to, to keep the standards up. So that I understand so there's five or six or so that in the last round of sales that your group has been listed on, but there may be more out there where Caltrans is the, is the enforcing agency. Uh, but I think it has to be the, the private organizations in through the three cities, Pasadena Heritage in Pasadena, uh, SPPF in Pass South Pass and LA Conservancy in Los Angeles, because you have to have people who have an incentive and knowledge and expertise to do this. You can't have a transportation agency have long-term responsibility either for affordable housing or for historic preservation. They just aren't able to do it. All right, uh, next question. For clarification, would the Portentino bill replace the Roberti Act? And that, that question has been answered in the chat room by uh, Senator uh, Portentino's office, uh, who says any bills in the process will amend sections of the Roberti Act, which is government code 54325, et cetera, and they would not fully replace the act. Uh, next question also relates to Senator Portentino's bill. Do we know when the Portentino bill would be heard and passed? Do we expect that the properties would be offered for purchase this year? Uh, I believe that Christy Lopez from Sen Senator Portentino's office asked, uh, responded that the bill is in the beginning stages. Ah, oh, I see it, yes. Uh -huh. And yes. Given yes, go ahead. Uh, Christy Lopez uh, from Senator Portino's office responded, the bill is in the beginning stages and given the legislative deadlines, it would have to be heard before April 30th. Uh, next question, would a tenant who purchased their home be permitted to build an ADU on the property? Again, if we could unmute Chris. The answer is that the state law on ADUs will apply uh, to all the owners uh, when they become property owners. So it's clear that the state law will apply generally. And, and, uh, and while in the past, you know, Caltrans has done some very onerous things to the former tenants who own their properties, including initiating foreclosures when they try to fix up the properties or try to refinance so that uh, I think, again, I, I believe that having the city as the management authority will allow more flexibility and get away from the Caltrans, uh, I don't know what you call it, a mission of vengeance against the tenants. I, I just, so I, I think the answer is yes. And I think we should go that direction. Okay, we have one final question. This will wrap up uh, the Q&A and bring us to the conclusion of tonight's program. And this one is for Chris. Uh, it says, Chris, isn't it true that all of these properties, meaning the Caltrans properties, should already be declared surplus properties? Well, as a practical scientific matter, that is correct. However, 
When the two bills that passed in the fall of 2019 were adopted, Caltrans asked Senator Portantino and asked Assemblyman Holden to have their bills include language that the freeway route would remain on the state highway map for future freeways until the year 2024. So that this question of what is surplus and what is not is something that Caltrans guards very jealously. And so far, they've only declared those 42 properties surplus. Oh, there's a few more that were on the list from 1995, but they are very afraid of having any kind of legislative determination that the houses are surplus now. As a scientific and logical matter, they're all surplus today. But in terms of Caltrans authority to choke the, the sales process, they are not because they haven't been officially declared surplus. You know, the governor could do that or his appointee at the head of Caltrans, but I believe they're being roadblocked by local and other Caltrans staff. But yeah, that, that should occur, but it hasn't yet. And until 2024, the, the, the bill that stopped the freeway have created this fiction that the freeway is still technically possible, which is of course nonsense. So they are surplus, but legally they're not yet. All right, thank you, Chris. And before we close tonight, I have an important announcement from Christy Lopez with Senator Portantino's office. She wants everyone to know that Senator Portantino's office is available for questions on the legislative process and any questions on SB 381. She can be reached at Christy, that's K-R-I-S-T-I dot Lopez, L-O-P-E-Z, at sen, S-E-N dot C-A dot gov. She can also be reached by phone at area code 909-599-7351. That's 909-599-7351. So again, thank you very much to Senator Portantino and to Christy uh, for uh, being so prompt in uh, responding to those questions related to uh, what they're working on. So folks, we're now at uh, 827 and this brings us to the end of tonight's informational forum. On behalf of the South Pasadena Preservation Foundation, I just wanna say how thankful and impressed I am by the number of uh, you who gave up valuable time tonight to uh, join us and to hear about the proposal. Um, again, this was all about information sharing, education, and helping you to make fully formed decisions about the best way to proceed. I think at the end of the day, we all want the same thing, which is uh, Caltrans out of the property management business <laughs> and getting back to building roads and uh, our local neighborhoods, whether you're in South Pass, Pasadena, or El Sereno, those local neighborhoods put back together uh, and, and thriving again. So once again, thank you. I wanna, before I go, I also wanna encourage everybody here tonight um, to register for and attend the forum that's being sponsored by Senator Portino's office in the city. That's this coming Monday at uh, 6 p.m. And you can go to the city website and there's uh, quite a bit of information on there about uh, the forum, about SB 381. So I highly encourage everybody to uh, sign up for that and, and participate in that forum as well. It's only by looking at all sides and all options will we come to the best solution. Thank you very much and good night.